Hey guys, welcome to the latest episode of Untitled Artwork. This week we are chatting to artist John Charles. I'm artist John Charles. Oh, f off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm artist John Charles from Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the worst person to be put on the spot. Don't Please look at us on the screen. If you don't look at yeah. us, you'll, you'll do all right. It's not even that. I don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> catch up. <laughs> Doing a face. <laughs> You've got some competition here, Carl. <laughs> yes. I don't know who's going to be worse, Carl or, or John. Hey, hey, hang on, hang on. You, you ain't so. The last few times you've been caught out yourself. In my head, I'm like, I'm John Charles, pick me uh, on campus. <laughs> we might just use that to be honest. Yeah. Well, I'm game for that. That seems like the best we're going to get right now. Uh, I'm artist John Charles, I'm a Liverpool based artist. Uh, I'm mainly known for my palette knife work, painting quite large on canvas, and my gold lines. There's obviously a, a bunch of topics that we want to we wanna sort of talk to you about, and, and just I don't know how much you know about our podcast anyway. Um, it's generally a lot to do with just the artwork, how successful artists have become, where they are, where they came from, what the story is, um, how they got into it why they don't do it, you know, full-time job, why they do it full-time themselves um, and sort of how they got started. So um, just as a start, mate, I, I want to sort of know about your, your general journey into artwork from when you were younger and then sort of leading into now. Yeah. So if you could. I was about five or six, I remember. I was always obsessed with drawing. So my mum and dad would get me like big, massive A1 a one sheets of paper and I would just sit there and I'd fill every single gap on the paper with Disney cartoons or any sort of cartoon. And I would just sit and draw and draw. So from an early age, the love for drawing was always there. Then when it really started, I really took off was, was my last year of primary school. Uh, my teacher, uh, who I'm still in contact with now, um, Janet Willis, she's actually living over in, in Shanghai mm -hmm. at the minute. She was she was basically an art teacher, but she had us for the whole year in primary school, and she just made art ridiculously fun, and I just I was obsessed with it. So then when I went into seniors, then all I wanted to do was art. By the time I got to, is it like third year seniors where you get to pick your, you get to pick what options? The options. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in my school, they give us the option of not doing French and not doing religious education, and I was just like, yeah, oof, gone. I'm not doing it. So I didn't, and they were like, so what are you going to do now? And I was like, I'll just do art. So for se my seniors, most of my classes was just art, art, art. So, uh, but then I think, yeah, I got an A in my GCSE art. And I've told this story a million times, but I I apparently I would have got an A star, but I had no coursework. So they judged me just on my actual GCSE pieces because some little dickheads in school put glue all inside me folder and glued all we work together. And I still know we is I want to get him one day. <laughs> Funnily enough, we've got him here now. <laughs> I see him every now and again pop up, pop up on Facebook. And I'm like, oh, yes. um, but literally, like I left school, so I was the youngest in my year, so I left at the age of 15. The day I left, the next day after leaving school, I started working, doing like agency work. I was working behind the bar. So the next day I was working in um, Wembley Stadium, pulling pints at the age of 15. But every pint I pulled, I'd have a pint. And that was like the beginning of the end for me. That. So from the age of 15, I never done art again because the, the alcohol abuse and the drug abuse just took over almost instantly. So from the age of 15 until I was 27, I don't really think I'd done any sort of artwork. I think. Really, yeah. Yeah, it was. I just got lost. I think maybe every now and again. So for me, it was alcohol and cocaine was like my big things. It really got worse and worse as the years went on to the point where, like, a two or three day bend, and I'd be going through like two thousand, three thousand pounds worth of coke just snorting. But artwork <clears> just did <throat> on me. But every now and again, I'd do like little doodles or little sketches or whatever. And um, 
one of my mates, he kept saying to me, you need to do something with your artwork, you need to do something with your artwork. And um, yeah, in the end, he was one of my best mates and he passed away. But before he passed away, he said to me to go speak to this other artist from Liverpool. And he said, you know, he might be able to help you out to become an artist kind of thing. So at that age, I was, I was about 27 at that point. And um, I decided to try and stop with the drinking drugs and I got into recovery. So I started going to Alcoholics Anonymous and Cocaine Anonymous. When that started, my art journey started as well. So I had to go to hospital to get an operation on my nose because I just ruined it. And I was housebound for four weeks. So my wife's dad come round with loads of canvases from home bargain and brushes. They just look like the arse end of a donkey. They were ridiculous. <laughs> and he was like, why don't you have a little go painting while you can't move off the house? So I started painting. So I think I'm about 27 at this point. And I was doing like um, Disney characters. So... Um, Winnie the Pooh, Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, things like that. And I put one of them on Facebook and some girl messaged and said, can I buy that? And I was like, eh, yeah, how much, do I, how much do I pay for it? And she was like, I'll give you 30 quid. I was like, Fuck. I was like, your first ever sale. Oh, yeah. Too. And I was like, fine, let's go for it. So I sold a painting on a little A3 canvas for 30 quid. So from then on out, I was just that, I was like a conveyor belt. I'd line up about six canvases in my room. And I'd just paint the same picture on each one. And then I start adding the kids' names to them so they were personalised. And it was going all right for a while. Um, but something didn't feel right with it. It was like I was literally copying like for like. So I was just... It wasn't art, really. It, do you know what I mean? It wasn't my style. So, yeah, that's the age of 27 when that happened. And it went like that for a good few years. And then, like I jump back so when my mate passed away and he, before he did he said go and speak to Danny O'Connor and I went round and seen Danny one day and I went in the studio and we had a little mess about painting and stuff and he kind of taught me about being free and just going for it with your paintings and all like just experimenting and there's no such thing as a mistake so <clears throat> after that day with him my whole artwork changed I went from just doing Disney to then copy and Danny <laughs> <laughs> for the, like, the next six months. So it was every, every it, it was just like you couldn't help but be influenced, I think, when it comes to art sometimes. That's why I don't follow many artists, so I don't yeah. get influenced by them without really getting onto it. So um yeah, so I started doing that and I started creating my own work and I found use of a palette knife. So my work now is mainly known for my palette knife work. So if anybody's listening who doesn't know what a palette knife is. It looks like a little trowel that a builder would use. You can get bigger ones, little ones, but I mainly use a palette knife for most of my work. And when I started using that, that's when things really took off for me. And then um, it was getting, we were getting quite a lot of publicity. I'd done a painting for Sacco when he paid, played for Liverpool. Um, I'd done a few paintings for Strongmen. And I'd done a, some paintings for like, uh, oh God, I can't think of the names now. Jess Glynn and a few of these things, a few like celebrities. And it started getting quite a good bit of coverage. And it was my wife who turned around to me and said, like, you need to just go for this now. Like, cause I've, been, I've been working in an office for 20 years as a civil servant. I was like a caged gorilla. An office environment is not for me. It's horrible. Um, anyway, we went away to Dubai <clears throat> to watch the world's ultimate strongman. And when we were there, my missus just said, pack it in now just resign so while we were there I sent an email resigned from my day job and ever since then I've been a professional artist now so it'll be it'll be three years in November that I've just been full time as an artist and it's been a fucking crazy journey yeah quality <laughs> mate well done yeah congratulations that's pretty impressive must have been um quite scary to make that jump um you know I've, I've kind of sort of did a, a similar path in terms of just being stuck in an office for sort of 20 years and just one day decide, well, I kind of did my art sort of in the background and just one day decided. So I just wanted to know like, what were the, the fears going through you? Or was it just like total relief sort of when you decided it was over? Um, how, like, was it a scary time for you? How did it feel sort of emotionally? You know what? It was exciting. Cause like, 
for me, obviously, with me drug background, I love to live on a like fucking crazy yeah. high. <laughs> and um, I had the belief in myself. Yeah. I believed it to a certain degree. Now, most of the people around me, family, friends, would be like, oh, don't resign. Why don't you just you know, reduce your days by two days? Or And I was like, so nobody had faith. And this goes back years and years. If you go back to Van Gogh, people were saying, nobody can make it as an artist. Yeah. You can't yeah. make a living as an artist. And my missus just said to me, if anyone can do it, you can do it. So just, just go for it. So I did, I just went for it. And that was in November 2019. And I went for it, I resigned. <laughs> and then we got f-ing stuck in lockdown for a week later. I was just like, no! Like, what the hell? So yeah, it was it was really, really exciting. Obviously, it was scary. Um, I don't know, I did say to you before, but I don't really want to touch on this subject. But it was um, obviously four months, well, six months, in, five months into being self-employed as an artist, and then the world just gets shut down. I was like, Shit. and we bricked it. We were like, are we going to have to get a loan to pay the mortgage? Yeah. You know? we, we're, we're homeowners. We've got a car. We, we flapped it. But again, my missus is like, she's she's incredible for this stuff. She was like, just listen, she's a little way. We'll do it. We'll be fine. So don't worry. So what we, me and my daughter, who was nine at the time, um, we done online art classes for free every day for four months. So we just go on Facebook, Instagram, and we done a live art class for kids to come on. We had adults on though as well, like with people from Italy, um, Australia, Mexico. I think in the first week we had twenty seven thousand people come online to draw with us. Wow, amazing! Wow, That's unreal. Nuts, honestly. God, and was that went... just like live video on Facebook? Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. It went massive, yeah. and it was like. Someone said, why didn't you just charge it one pound each? <laughs> but, <laughs> you know what? It was probably like, we just done it because we wanted, I needed something to occupy my head. I needed something to occupy my daughter's head so she wasn't worried. And we just made it like a little safe space for people to come in, kids, to forget about anything that was going on in the world, and just get lost in your artwork with us. And it did. And um Within about two months of that happening, my sales just went whew, through the roof. And I would say around 80% of my artwork sales for the next year or so after that was either grandparents or mums or aunties, uncles of the kids who joined our art class. Wow. That's it was just like man. the biggest saving grace ever. It was just mental. Yeah, that's... That- that was um it's it rings true to what we say. Like we, we we're filming a podcast series at the moment about how to sell your first thousand pieces of artwork or anything creative. And one of the main themes of it is is giving value first and giving away for free. So we just yeah. know that that's the best marketing tool, whether it's intentional or not. When yeah. you give that value to people, they're the people that are most likely to to like you and, and stay in contact with you and then buy off you eventually. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, I think so it, you see the same theme, whoever we speak to. We did stuff like that for for quite a, a, a bit of bit of time, like where I would do certain celebrity paintings. And for me, I want to obviously the memories are for me as well, but I'd like to make memories for my daughter. So she got to meet all these people and we'd give them the painting for free. And it served a good purpose. And it was great because we were making all these memories and the profile was growing and we were getting a lot more exposure. And then one day my daughter turned around to me and she said, Dad, why do you give all these celebrities paintings for free, but you charge <laughs> normal people money for them? And I was like, oh. So from then on out, we were like, right, that's it now. Uh, we kind of like, ain't asked to give all these people free stuff. Everybody pays for the work now, unless it's a charity based painting. Yeah. Otherwise, it, was, it can get out of hands, I think, giving free stuff away. I I think the the charity side of it is a is a thing I've done to kind of to make up for that because I've had the same dilemma as you. So I, I worked with Pep Guardiola a couple of months ago, or just before Christmas actually, and I did an illustration, gave it to him. Um, but then like my end of the bargain was I got him to sign three or four of them and gonna raff, gonna raffle them off for charity. Um, so you know, so in that sense, like I'd rather 
he didn't pay me because he wasn't going to buy it off me but at least we're doing some good out of it but i i, I think it, you're totally right like it just in general we live in this weird age don't we where like the richer you are the less you have to pay for yeah it's ridiculous it does my head in yeah there's, there's a couple of i wouldn't even name drop them because i I feel I'm not like that, but there's been a, a couple of them who we've done free paintings for, and like I know one of them is up in his hallway now, and he's a quite a big, big footballer. We got no recognition of him whatsoever. Right. Like we didn't get a single post on his social media, nothing. But I know that painting's in his house. Yeah. Um, stuff like that really that that pisses me off. But I think. From an art point of view, one thing that I'm really concerned, like that I have in my head now, is that by giving away too much, you devalue your own work. And I think that that's like tying a rope around your neck for an artist. If you devalue your work, I find like it's really hard to come back from stuff like that. Yeah, I, yeah. I think I always I always approach any sort of client based work with more so with that in mind because I suppose at the moment, like maybe the last six months or twelve months. Um, I've been doing a lot more client commission stuff rather than selling prints. Uh, and it, the first time you lowball yourself, well, that at, at the very least, that person, they'll never pay you your rate ever again. You've, you've established what the value is now. So that's why I always say to people, if somebody says like, oh, could you do us this for 50 quid? But, you know, it'll be worth it in the long run. F*** will it? Like, they will just continue to try and get <laughs> that price out of you. Yeah. yeah. I think I've been quite lucky with a lot of my um, support and collectors who have stuck with me. So I've got people from the very beginning who have bought a painting for like £150 to most recently buying one for £4,000. So that collector has he's been there from the very at the forefront and at no point turned around and said, oh, hang on, well, I used to get them for this place. Yeah, and they, they, I think I've been quite lucky with stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just gonna say I do think it's a bit of a balancing act, though, for um, when you're starting up to kind of what you do do for free to get the exposure, and then you know what you charge people because you know if you kind of come in and people don't know who you are and you sort of steam in at the high end of prices, you know people don't really know how genuine you are. So you kind of I, I can see why you gave away the pictures for free because you know it was um it's difficult. You know what I mean. Um, but you know, I, I I get it. I think that um, you have to at some point, you know, definitely um, make that change and and sort of not give stuff out for free. You know, yeah. yeah. Some one of my mates always says to me like, "You've got to know your worth." And for that was like, I think that's a hard thing to do because this is why my wife's my manager now. Because if somebody emailed me and said, "Can you paint this portrait of my me uncle who passed away? How much is it?" I just thought, oh, it's for free, you can have it. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm yeah. awful for emotions and stuff. I just, I'm straight away, I'm like, oh, I'll do it for free. Whereas now I've got my wife who will sit in the middle and she's got like no connection between yeah. the artwork or the client. She the sees it purely as a business. And that's what I need because I'm absolutely shite at it. Yeah. But there, there, there's a, there is a line even like this week, I, I, I got asked to do a commission and I stopped doing commission work because the amount I was earning with other work was so much higher. And then I'd get I still get people now saying like, Can you do me one of them? And I'll go, Yeah. But it's it's gonna cost you quite a bit more than what you think it's gonna be. And they go, Go on, how much and you you give them a price. And they'd be like, But your prints are only twenty quid and you're like, Yeah, but that's not a bespoke that's not a bespoke yeah, exactly. piece of art that I'm gonna sit down and make sure it's right for you. That like it's 10, 10, 20 years of skill that's going into that 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 painting. It's not just a oh we are it's a prim for twenty quid. Do you know what I mean? I th I think the one thing like I'd always say to anybody that asks me like Carl makes a really good point. When you're starting out, it's like the wild west, isn't it? Like you can't you can't judge it the same as you you do when you you're five years into a career. But like it, at any point in your career. You always have to be good at judging the value you're getting back. So, like, yeah, if, if a random person on Instagram or Twitter says, I've got 20 quid, could you draw me a picture? The answer most likely will be to tell them to fuck off. But, like, you know, I've, <laughs> nice I've done... 
yeah i mean it depends on who they are it doesn't have to be that nice <laughs> um but like i've done things where like a twitter account will message me when i was starting and they've got a hundred thousand followers and they're like oh could you do us this picture i'll use it as my profile picture and i'll shout you out it's like and that is some value you might decide it's not the right amount of value to do it or you could decide that it is but like as long as there's value coming back the other way then it, there's always a process by which you can decide if you want to do it yeah, yeah. that's good that that, that's one of the questions I was actually going to ask you, John, what was that it's right on that value. So I don't know whether you started with different prices when you first started being a, a full-time artist or you changed them along the way, but how did you initially go from being working in an office to being able to price your work accordingly to know that it was going to be enough for you to survive on? Yeah, so... When I very first started, like I said earlier, my paintings were £30 each. I was based in an office at that point. I think that the way I kind of based it at one point was the bigger I was painting, the bigger the price. Yeah. So then I went up to like a standard 36 by 36 inch painting. And I was selling out, I just put, I thought like 150 quid, I'll go with that. And then I think I just thought to myself, hang on, these are worth more than this. So I went from 30, I think, to 150 to 250. And then I got involved with a manager, whatever she wants to call herself. I'm not part <laughs> now. crank. And I hope she hears that. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing I want to say to artists out there is be careful for people, agents and stuff like that who want to get involved because they they're in it for themselves, isn't they? So many of them are horrible. Um, but anyway, so but I did learn some things when I was involved with this person. And straight away, she was like, your price is going up to £500 a painting. And I was like, off. Like, nobody's going to pay for that. Put them up. They started selling. Then they went up to 750 And they started, they carried on selling. Then we went up to 995 And they carried on selling. So we've kind of just, I feel like, I've probably learned more about the value of work. Like if you look around at other other artists and look at your profile, and I know you shouldn't really judge yourself, by, but I'm looking at other work and I'm thinking mine's better than that. Yeah. You know, you know, like I feel like my work's better than that, and if they're getting that amount, then I I, I reckon I can as well. So I know that sounds a little bit big-headed, but I feel oh, like you're gonna do way. it though. Yeah. You believe in yourself, you know. It's a minefield. It's like you just got to go for it. And that's the way I've just gone with it. And obviously then I've done some massive paintings recently, like six foot by five, seven foot, seven foot by five foot. And that was a £4,000 painting. And yeah. I was like, is it going to sell? Is it not? But in my head, I thought, I'm not asked. I'm putting yeah. it up there. And if it sells, it sells. If it doesn't, it'll just stay in me house with me. Yeah. And I think that's, yeah. that's where I got to the point was like, I'm not asked. If it sells, it'll sell. If it doesn't, I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, So, you know, some of your earlier paintings, you said you sold for like 30 quid and as they were going up. Have you ever seen any of them sort of, because I'm assuming these people have got these paintings now, the value would have gone up on them because of the price of your That's a good price. Probably. Have you ever... <laughs> <laughs> I just wondered if you've ever seen someone try to resell one, like, you know, purchase for 30 and then sort of try to sell it at a higher price. I think um, somebody done it with two boxing paintings that I'd done. I'd done one of Floyd Mayweather. And um, I think he bought them for 150 off me and he banged them on eBay for 500 quid or something like that. Because somebody messaged me saying, is this one of yours? And I was like, yeah, it is. And then I don't, they, they weren't for sale anymore. So somebody's obviously bought them. But uh, I can't imagine them Disney ones, people selling them. But <laughs> do you know what though, for me, one thing I always say to people is like, so I've just signed with, with a PR over in Dubai and I said to her, like, this might sound a bit far fetched, but I said, if you can make me a million pounds and you make yourself 10 million pounds and you're honest about it, then I would love you to make all that money on yeah. the back of what I've done. I'm not bothered. Like, as long as it's not being done sneaky to try and rip you off, then yeah, I'm happy. Yeah. So if somebody said to me, can you do me this painting? And I like, right, yeah. 1500 quid but they knew they were going to sell it for 10 grand tomorrow then for me that would be sneaky I wouldn't yeah. like that but um, if somebody bought a painting off me two years ago 
and then now they like they, they just think it's either not for them or they've got money troubles and they can sell it and make five, five ten times more. Then I'd be made up for them. Yeah, I've said the same since since I started. Like I was about. Obviously, I'm still sort of at a full time job at the moment, for now. Um, but my art's at a point where I, I think I could go full time on it. Um, but when I first started, I was like, I was like, how do I price this? And I kept saying to people, because I, I had sort of the same thing. People were going, you should do something with your art. You should do something with it for years. And then um, I was, when I was thinking of selling it, people, I forgot the point I was going to make. It's <laughs> not like you. I forgot the point I was going to make. It was a bit to do with to do with price. Sorry, yeah, I kept saying to people, "Well, if you can sell it, you can keep half the money." That's what I was saying. So I was like, "If you can sell my artwork, because I had no idea how to sell." I was like, "Do I go online? Do I go to stores?" And I was like, "You can keep half the money." And this is still an open offer to people. If you want to sell my artwork and keep half the money, f- fair play to you, because you, you you're making me money for, for. I'll just do the art and you do the sales. So, you know, I can see why why people are going to that sort of side of it yeah i i sell prints of mine wholesale to a couple couple of clients um yeah, over in over in ireland and i think you know they pay me 25 percent of what they retail them for that's absolutely fine because so much so much less of the work is in my corner um so you know i don't i have no i have no problem with that whatsoever um like you said but like like john said you just you want that business relationship to be open and full of trust don't you not somebody yeah, yeah. sneakily trying to get one over on you yeah, yeah. i think something like that i think it's a great shout whereas you know you're going in at 25 percent there make 75 well they might be able to sell like a thousand of them prints where if you do it on your own you might as well be able to sell 20. exactly so yeah, exactly the money side it balances out in the end doesn't it and they're being yeah. honest with you as well from the off because like if you go to a gallery now it's pretty hard to get into any sort of gallery where they don't take 50 60 percent anyway yeah most yeah. of them are really high price but you get way more exposure to being in the gallery so it's like sometimes it's worth taking that financial hit for the extra exposure because you might sell a hundred times more from yeah. being in the- definitely i know you mentioned a lot of your sort of early community people from the free stuff that you were doing bought a load of your artwork yeah where where's where did most of your sales come from now or where they historically come from and is that still the same now um, facebook and instagram facebook. was quite big well all i'd say over the last six months a lot of it's been like word of mouth as well because what yeah. i i like to ask is so if i'm delivering uh, if i sell an original paint i try my best to see if i can hand deliver it because it's just nice to see the person in the flesh and thank them. And I always say to say to people, where did you see me work? And a lot of the time it's like, oh, well, we made sport one off you. Yeah. And it's not even, some of them aren't even on social media or anything anymore. A lot of it is like, oh, such and such has got one of yours. So word of mouth and Instagram, Facebook, Twitter does not like me at all. <laughs> <laughs> I f- hate Twitter. <laughs> you actually didn't you leave Twitter for quite a while? Yeah, biggest mistake ever. I deleted the account. I only had about five thousand followers, but I was just done with it because it was a poisonous, poisonous atmosphere. It was like yeah, you could it's... be the nicest person in the world and you will get mm-hmm. slated for it. I and, uh, agree with that. I remember Adam Rowe made a made a comment about a girl who announced that she's now um, in remission and cancer free. And somebody had to go at it, you selfish bastard. My dad still got cancer. Oh, my what? God. And it was that sort of, I just thought, I can't be doing with Twitter. So I deleted yeah. it, and I left. But then when I was I was about to sign a contract to release some NFTs, they were like, you need to be on Twitter. So I started it up again. A year, and I've still only got about 400 followers on it. I can't move on it. Yeah, it's... Um... Oh. I've seen that sort of love hate relationship you've got there. I, it, Twitter it, seems to work if you've got big tits and blonde hair or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why, mate? Like, yeah, I mean, I've got it's... I've got half of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a mad place because for, for yeah. me, ninety percent of my sales come through there. Yeah, yeah same. Yeah, honestly, mate. Yeah, yeah. and I think, and I've I've I've, gr- I've grown like. 
ten thousand followers in the last twelve months. Well, yeah. I say it was it was over like nine months really because I haven't really been putting the leg work in in twenty twenty two. Yeah, it's just sometimes it just and like I, I see it sometimes. Like obviously, you all follow each other online, and even the picture that you posted the other day, John. I think I retweeted it saying this is f-ing boss, and I, I I was thinking that anyway when I looked at it, but. I I posted a piece a new piece of artwork about an hour before you did, and I I only got like three likes on it, and it st- still happens like to to people who've got massive followings, and I've put a load of time into it. I was like, fuck, I only got three likes, and I seen yours, and yours had something similar, and I was like, it's probably one, and it was probably you. Yeah, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, but I was I was I was just baffled that like sometimes you can post something, and you'll get fifty to hundred likes, and then you know you'll post a unbelievable piece of artwork other artists not myself and you just won't get any traction and i don't know where it's their algorithm isn't it yeah, it's, yeah i don't know how it works uh, the vast majority of my stuff on twitter doesn't even get past five or ten likes it just on its ass every time and yeah. it, i don't know if twitter's a place where you've got to post all day <clears throat> yeah. like I, me, I can't be asked with that i'll come on and i'll post once and then i'm off I think yeah. I think that's exactly it. I mean, yeah. obviously, I've got a large following, and I find that if I don't tweet for a period of time and release something, it won't get many likes. But then, if I've you know, like for example, I tweet during the football and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, and then if I release a piece, sort of, you know, maybe the next day, uh, it seems to get a lot more likes than when you go for a period of just not being involved. And I think it kind of that's how the algorithm in it works. If you're a regular poster, then your stuff gets seen more. What I've gone for now is, so in the end, I've got my own website, <clears throat> built a website, and on that we have like a mailing list, so people sign up to the website. Yeah. And at the minute, I think we've got 1,200 people on there. So that is what I'm trying to build my base around now, is not my Instagram, not my Facebook, not Twitter, but my website. Because mm-hmm. when we send an email out on the website now, we have around about 60, 70% open rate. So we know 70% of them people are actually open the email. That's great. That's really so good. They, That's unreal. the image. Whereas I put a post on Instagram the other day and I got 57 likes. And my head went and I was like, That's it. I'm not an artist anymore. <laughs> good. That me paint pushes up. But yeah. it, it, it made me feel like, shit. but then I have to try and refocus on my. Surely, the people who are saying it aren't going, oh, I'm not liking that. Because yeah. I have faith in my work that a lot of it is good. And I just think the social media side of things can really f about with artists at the minute. Yeah. People Massively. in general. So oh, now, yeah. the big thing for me is build my website base um go that way with it. Yeah. I was going to say, um, I see, like, for example, I see these two, I follow these two guys and follow these two guys for. For years, and sometimes I don't see the post they've posted until like five days later, and I'm like, "How have yeah. I not seen this artwork?" <laughs> you know, I've been on Instagram on a daily basis, or and they've posted it, and then you know, I don't see the piece they've posted until five days di- five days later, and I'm thinking, "Yeah, he's like, my, I'm a bastard because I haven't liked it for <laughs> whatever <laughs> reason." Yeah, it it does mess with it, but sometimes like the the likes, like you said, it does mess with you because my most liked piece is not my most sold piece. It doesn't yeah. work that way. Like, yeah, mine's de- mine's definitely not my best piece either. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And it's like I, I've got stuff that I've sold thousands of copies of that didn't really do that well on on social media. So yeah, yeah. it's just it's just sort of how how you market yourself. And, but and you're totally right to refocus because you've got to remember that those likes don't mean sales. They don't mean you know that your business all of a sudden is going to boom. Sometimes you get you know I've had things I've had over a thousand likes and. I've not sold a single thing. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, it doesn't yeah. always translate. And I think you're right. To re- you have to refocus yourself and remember that is not as much as you, you get the exposure because that's what you're really doing is showing people what you get out. And of course you may get some sales, but that's not the main focus of what you need to do. And I think what you're doing is, you know, building your website and building your community and, and generally people who buy stuff off you and people that come back and have bought previously or, or like you said, word of mouth is is always a great way to sort of, you know, let people know about artists and stuff. So I think the way you're doing it is, 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 is a really good way to do it. And a lot of people need to sort of just remember that is probably the best way to focus yourself. 
Uh, website investments is probably one of the, again, if, if, if you're looking at other artists listening in, a bit of advice I would give was try and get a, a good website started now and start building that, that client base because yeah. I think just the way social media is going at the minute, it can, he could just pull the plug on it at any minute, couldn't he really, if he wanted to, or yeah. he can kick you off it at any minute, or you can get hacked. I don't, I don't believe people get hacked. I think it's just. <laughs> um, but by having your website there, then you've got a good, solid platform, a good base to work off. Yeah, yeah. It's good yeah, advice. I think our first guest, Dave Will, uh, once said to me, like, the best thing for him was having that mailing list. Because it meant, you know, he could guarantee basically like a certain number of sales whenever he released anything, which is really good. Uh, I just on on the social media thing, um, it's so it's so interesting. I struggle with it as we all do. I remember I put a poll out not that long ago that said like, for an artist, when do you consider a piece finished? And like the one that got the most votes was when I've posted it on social media. And I was like, and that's so emblematic of like everything that's wrong with that, isn't it? Like. It, you know, but it, I think it's true. Like, I still, I live with a piece until I've put it on Instagram or Twitter. Like, and at that point, I feel like I don't think about it as much now. But until I've done that, it's still like it's work in progress. Do you know what I've just done? I've just got three paintings. I'll, I've got a room upstairs. So all my artwork is rolled up in tubes like this because I paint on just a raw canvas and then stretch it afterwards. Yeah. There was three paintings that I've done probably about two years ago. One was of Anthony Joshua. One was um, Molly May, who goes out with Tyson Fury, because we tried to see if we could link it, link it up to meet my daughter. And then there's one of the library building where the um, the Hilton Hotel blends into the bottom of it. And they were all just like black and white monochrome paintings. And, but in my head, I was like, they're not finished, them are they? Two years later, or whether, about two weeks ago, took them in the studio and just redone them again with all like mad pink fluorescent paint and everything all over them and now I'm like yes now they're finished but that's sometimes I'll have a painting could be there if it hasn't sold or if I haven't released it I'll just go and work on it again like totally completely different as well that, that, that's the, the bad thing about digital like I, I sing digital art praises because of how versatile it is and how easily you can edit and how quickly you can you can put multiple pieces together and resell them as a different piece. You like that, it, it's got so many benefits. But the every artist that I know is a perfectionist, and if if you've got a digital piece sitting there, it's so easy to just get it and edit it. Whereas if yeah. it's like something like yours, John, you obviously have to get all your trials ready and get all your paint sorted. So it's it's, it's not as tempting to go and re-edit a piece. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Have you ever considered doing? digital art or moving across to a screen and maybe trying to stylist and to paint that way? Do you know what? I've done very basic, basic digital art, but I mean like flat colours and stuff, no blending or anything like that. And it would just be on the iPad that I was doing it. Yeah. So I'd quite often, I'll be, if I'm doing a piece, I might sketch up on the iPads anyway. If I'm not using a pad and paper, like, like right there, one sec. This is how bad some of my sketches have been. <laughs> so I might have done, this is going to look bad, this, you know, a pastel drawing, dead quick. I can guarantee it's better than mine. Yeah, there you go. That's pretty <laughs> cool, man. Um, yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's sick. Just little yeah. things, so I, I'll practice like that. So that's where you get your, your sort of speed drawing in to get your ideas out. Yeah, some of these are shocking. Look at Johnny Cash's eyes. <laughs> I thought that was Joe Joe Pesky. Hasbola. <laughs> Little Hasbola. <laughs> but yeah, I get him on the pod. Well, quite often I will do a digital drawing as well. Yeah. But not anything like what you can do. Jesus Christ, no. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. Simple as I couldn't. I haven't yeah, got that uh, talent to do. Uh, you, you give me a palette knife and a, a three foot canvas, and I'll just shit myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just shit on the canvas. It'll just look like a dirty <laughs> protest. <laughs> I do it, It's. I mean, it's something that like the because I started with with charcoal, so I had a load of originals that I sold recently, um, and I'm always tempted to go back to it. It's just the time. I, I just. 
of being able to create a piece that I can sell a thousand times in an hour compared to spending seven, eight, nine, ten hours on something that I might only get 200 quid for. I'm just like, I'm just, even, I could probably get more for them, but I'm just, but I'm always tempted to, because I've never really painted. I've only done little bits and bobs, but I know it'd look okay if, it, if I had to go. I, I just wouldn't know where to start. I, I, I think every artist has that fear of other mediums. Yeah, I think once you've got your medium, it's, for me, it'd be it'd be hard to come away from yeah. acrylic yeah. paint. Now, I couldn't even use yeah, oils because it takes too long to dry and I'm, I'm way too impatient. Like yeah. I want, If I'm painting, I'll have my heater on full blast. So that oh, really? I ain't quicker. So Amazing. I can hide right away. Is that why you always have your top off in your videos? <laughs> <laughs> That's because he wants his he wants his perfect tits on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many levels to this, John. We're starting to know you're inside that. You know what? Right, so you just mentioned Twitter there. So I done a painting of um, I think it was of Leighton Baines. So this will be on my old account. And some lad come on because I had my top off and started saying, "You just like fucking Katie Price, you you little." <laughs> Um, you'll be down for having me docks selling your ass next and everything. Just wow. give more use. Oh my because God, I that's amazing. Off. And I was like, oh. all right. So I was being dead, dead polite back to him. I was more like just probably pissing him off even more. But then yeah. behind the scenes, I was messaging people saying, get me his address because I'm going to go f- leather him now. <laughs> <laughs> In, within about half an hour, he deleted his, his tweets. But yeah. for yeah. me, it was like, Where's that abuse just come from? Because I had me top off on, on a f-ing video. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really I'm really sorry that I said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's the surprise of the podcast. Yoni's been trolling you for years, John. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh. but it is. In, uh, you mentioned celebrities a few times, uh, and obviously uh, uh, there's nothing better than a than an endorsement from a celebrity, especially if they share it online. Um, I've had a few myself, but I- I've noticed it's not really gained as much traction as what it, it sort of used to do. You know, when you used to get a celebrity yeah. endorsing you, but yours seem because yours is original pieces, and you sort of you go and visit them, and you get that that meeting with them as well. Is, is, do you see it as uh, as a, as do you like? Is that a big thing for you when a celebrity gets old of what you've done? Um, or is it is it sort sort of by the wayside now? No, it's, do you know what? Like, I think if you paint somebody yeah. and they end up owning that piece, I don't feel like you can really better that. Yeah. You know, like, as a compliment for your artwork, for that person to own your painting, especially if they bought it, if the money, you know, like, if it, you haven't just had to give them it, if they bought the piece, then that's incredible. I remember I done a, a paint with Stephen Graham a while back and one of his mates bought the painting for him and I was sat in the house and my phone went. I was like, hello. And he went, all right, John, it's Steve. And I was like, F- off. And he, <laughs> told me, he just told me just to say thank you for the painting and how much he loved it. And like he'd done paintings before. He's had paintings off other people, but this one seemed to capture him the best. And it was like, wow, that's mad, that. Brilliant. It's, it is nice. It's, um, but at the same time, not just when it's a celebrity. So around Christmas... I had like a week where I didn't have, I had just, I could do whatever I wanted. I didn't have a commission in place. So I wasn't working on exhibition work. And I put out there watching the paint. And some woman just cheekily said, why didn't you paint my nan? She's a hundred and, hundred and nine, I think she said she was. Plus, I think she was a hundred and nine. And I was like, F- it, all right, I'll paint your nan. So I was on a portrait and I took it round to the girl and she was crying her eyes out. Her husband was in bits. And then she sent me a photograph a week later of a nan holding the painting. That was priceless. That I feel like that was like probably one of the highs, you know, like of seeing somebody with your artwork. I think she's yeah. 109, something like that. Yeah, I love that. That's amazing. That's, That's so cool. I've never thought about this before, but what you've just said has really kind of cr- clarified it for me. You know, to varying degrees, we've all had experiences of celebrities and people that we, you know, look at as kind of icons like with our work but i would actually say that like any message i've got where somebody's gone oh yeah my kid was made up with the print 
um, you know, really delighted. Or um, I know you're an ambassador for the Owen McVeigh Foundation, John, and I gave them a few boxes full of different prints, framed prints, different sizes, some postcards, some calendars, um, Christmas before last that they gave out to a bunch of the the kids. Um, and like, and then I got told how much how much that meant to them. And I feel like that's actually always like I carry that a lot more than any celebrity thing I've ever done, really. Definitely, I agree with that. Yeah. Like, I think the celebrity thing's always like a little, Ooh, but you know, I think we've heard of all ends our stripes now. Like, yeah, they, yeah, they should be happy that we're on a photograph with them. With our work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I like it. I like the confidence. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's like not forgetting where you came from, you know, and and not you know going way above where you're stationed to a certain extent. Because I think it's always important to give back to because these are the people that made you who you are, really and truly. Like you said, you know, some of the artwork, like you said, is given away for free to celebrities. So the people that are not the celebrities are the ones that propel you to the position you're in. And I think that is just as important to, you know, give back to them as well. And just what you touched on there about uh, the Old McVeigh Foundation, like they've been incredible for me. Um, so you might have seen the stuff that we did with Virgil van Dyke recently. So Virgil, yeah. Sam, yeah. the of our prints for us. And he was just no bother. And he was just like, yeah. Because it, it wasn't because it was me. It was because it was helping the Old McVeigh Foundation. Yeah. And on the back of that, um, we ended up raising a ridiculous amount of money. So what did we, we done? The 50, internet, uh, 50 prints, we donated £25 from every print to the Old McVeigh Foundation. Then I had my documentary, um, Private Viewing in the Fact Cinema. We had two private viewings for that. And out of... We donated a thousand pounds for the ticket sales to the Old McVeigh Foundation, <clears throat> and then on that night, when we were about to present Joe Mark with the check, one of my mates just went, "Add another thousand to that," and then this other fella who was there went, "Add another two thousand to that." Really? So the Old McVeigh Foundation ended up getting six thousand pounds in total. Amazing! Wow. And that was just from people just being just nice people, you know, like just they was they didn't want anything from it. None of them even wanted to be like photographed to do with it. They just wanted to do it. The only reason, obviously, is when you've got people buying something off you and you're promising X amount is going to get donated to a charity, then you need to reveal exactly how much has been donated. Yeah, you need transparency, but, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But these people who were doing this, they didn't even want any recognition. They were just like, just to be nice. And I think yeah. that would go a hell of a long way. Yeah. It's fu funny. <laughs> Funnily enough, because I I'm always looking for things to to do like that and give people because I've got even just prints lying around the house for years of having stuff that I've not sold and I'm always I usually just message people on on social media and say I know you you're involved in this charity or whatever, but just just on that note, <laughs> I've done stuff publicly on Twitter before and I've got <laughs> for it because <laughs> people think you're doing this to like make money and I, I'll say like. I've got 50 prints and I'm giving every one of them away for free. And people are messing me like saying, why are you, why are you doing that? I'm like, no, like, can't I just do something nice? That's why when we feel like we have to justify ourselves when I'm saying, look, we've just raised X amount of money. And yeah, obviously it does make us look like we're being nice people, but <clears throat> you've got to do it because otherwise you could just be pocketing every penny of it. Yeah. You should yeah. explain that shit. That pisses oh. me off. You shouldn't have to explain that. Yeah, but you, you've been doing charity work for a while. I've noticed that that's one, actually one of the things I wanted to ask you about. How did you get involved with the Old McVeigh? Did they approach you and, and how long have you been doing the, the charity work for? So charity work in general, I think I've done from the very beginning. So one of my first exhibitions in St. Helens World of Glass, the painting that I had in that, we auctioned off for um, a homeless shelter charity. So that's always been something that we've done, like charity work. But at one point in one year, I think we donated around about £10,000 worth of artwork. It was just, like I said earlier, I'm saying no. I'm like, yeah, go on, you can have it, you can have it. And I just, we needed to step back and be like, right, let's pick three charities that we're going to work with now then. So we done that for a little bit. And then um, I listened to Mark McVeigh on the Leggett podcast and he was talking about the old McVeigh Foundation. I was driving my car. And I just cried my eyes out, mate. Honestly, yeah, it's a powerful, powerful podcast. 
So if anybody who hasn't listened to that, go on the Legger podcast and listen to the, the Mark McVeigh on the talk about the Old McVeigh Foundation. I came home to me, missus. She'd been listening to it. And we both just went, we need to work and do something for them. So I just reached out and um, I offered a little bit of, I can't remember what it was at first. I think I offered a couple of frame prints. And Mark was lovely, very welcoming. And I think they made about £800 at one of the auctions off two of my prints. And then I said to Jen, I was like, listen, we just need to just work. We just want to do stuff for them now. So it was like, it's easier than having a million different charities coming at you. Because now we tend to just say, listen, we can't. We've got our dedicated charity now, and we just work with them all the time. <clears throat> Apart from when I've done that Giants Live one on Saturday in the strong for the strongman, um, they had their own charity, so I couldn't turn that to them and say no, no. But we, I was for stuff, something like that. I was happy for that to go there, um, and that raised like five thousand pounds for one of the prints. That was incredible. But yeah. for us, we tend to just stick with the Old McVeigh Foundation now as much yeah. as I can. When you see what they do, a lot of charities, I feel, come out at Christmas and you see them for November, December, and then you don't hear yeah. off the rest of the year. Yeah. The Old McVeigh Foundation, every single day, are just constantly making incredible memories for you know kids who probably aren't going to live a very long life and look after the families as well. Yeah, superb. I'll... I, I message it after the podcast because like i said i've been got a lot of stuff that i i'm not selling that i could definitely um that could definitely be used to, to raise some some funds even if it's a few quid john so um we'll, get, we'll get some links put up that. on the yeah yeah, we'll link to that episode of the Leggett podcast that John mentioned, and we'll put a link to the Owen McVeigh Foundation in the description of this episode for sure. Um, I just, I just wanted to um, to rewind a little bit to something you mentioned before. Um, you mentioned that the reason you came back to Twitter was that you had a series of NFTs that you were about to drop. Uh, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about that. We've done an episode on um, solely on NFTs already on our channel, and um, we're actively involved in a few NFT projects. I think something that we get me all... in. <laughs> I have been really shit all over by two companies now. You chose okay. Mates, honest to God, I've had a signed a contract with one of them to release two collections in 12 months. All the contact come through. I got all the work done. Everything was ready to go. And then they just went radio quiet, radio silence for ages. Um, I'm not going to drop the names into it, but they, we literally held off for 12 months with this, this company. Um, they just shit all over us. So we had to get a solicitor involved to get us to pull out of the contract that was, that was with them. So that we had really, to pay yeah. To cancel the contract, and uh, turns out the company had, had gone to shit anyway, they just hadn't told us. So then I got involved with another company, didn't sign the contract, but we went for four meetings and handshakes, everything was going ahead. I even took some of the images off sale off my website because they were going with, they were going to be NFT releases, and again, just didn't hear off them for four weeks, something like that. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's quite a sore point for me. Now, yeah. can't be, I, I was seeing some of your stuff on um, TikTok. I can't yeah. get back into the TikTok account no more. <laughs> I'm logged out and I can't get back into it, but I really enjoyed your stuff on there because I think he was, he was one specific about NFTs and I sure yeah. we missed But Just about how to upload them and get started and create yeah. them and stuff. But I'm at a point now where I'm like, I just want to get in with a project yeah. And have somebody else do all the work for it. And yeah. If I can get 50% out of the sale and they get 50%, then I'm not asked. I'd be happy with that. But yeah, um, we're, we're the same, to be honest. Yeah. 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 yeah it's um... yeah, more focused on. Because I, th- I think the one the one of the reasons for us not to get too laywayed by this, but um, is so much about NFTs is what utility can be offered off the back of someone owning it rather than just selling it as a piece of art. Um, and we as three individuals have. A limited amount of utility that we can therefore offer so we're always looking for really interesting projects to partner with rather than um you know we're still selling our own art we're still creating our own stuff but that's not really the primary focus from like a, a business point of view anymore right yeah because you have all this yacht club stuff and everything don't you yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, you're gonna start off from that. <laughs> <laughs> too pricey, mate. Too pricey <laughs> for us to get involved. Yeah, yeah, for me, yeah the, N- the NFT stuff was that's where I was gonna start releasing it on Open Sea and stuff, but I've got that much other that a lot of other stuff going on. Yeah, that I haven't got the time to focus on that, and that's why signing up with these companies would have been perfect because we can be like, listen, there's a collection of four. So there might be four NFTs. One of them might be a one of one. And if you buy the NFT, you get the original patent. The others might be one of 25. And you buy an NFT and you get a limited edition print as well. Yep. We were going to run with something like that. But like I said, we've just been <laughs> all over twice now to the point where I'm like, I'm not yeah. too sure. I don't, want to, I don't want to trust them people now is a massive thing for me. I don't yeah. trust very many people because... The two NFT people that we've got on board with, I come away and I was like, Jen, they're amazing. He's so nice. He's lovely. And then, <laughs> on. Yeah, that that that's a shame as well, isn't it? Because it's it's small experiences like that that can taint the whole industry for you if you're not if you're not careful. Um, I think it's like I think like I said, John, if you if you need any advice or if there's anything that we can speak about separate to the pod, especially on NFTs, then. More than happy to uh, jump on a call with you separately about that. Definitely. Yeah, and then um, for anybody wanting to learn more about NFTs, go and watch the Untitled Artwork NFT episode, which uh, <laughs> nice you'll plug. find on our channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good plug. <laughs> I'll on that one later. <laughs> yeah. But it's, um, there's, there's, there's a load of other stuff I think we're touching on an hour that, we, that we've done, John. I don't know what your time's like, but there's a load of other stuff that we... Um, sort of wrote down to talk about um i wanted to i wanted to sort of these are a couple of things that you've sort of already gone over but um for me like like with the aim of this podcast is to find out what makes people successful and what they think makes them successful as well and the main thing that i wanted to ask you and bearing in mind that sort of aspiring artists are, are watching this what is the key thing or what are the key things that make you a successful full-time professional artist and what 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 can people learn from that you f- <laughs> <laughs> um, at no point have I sold myself out <clears throat> um, and I think I am who I am like I'm always just the same person so one thing I hate in the art world is these arty farty people who you know like act like they don't know what they're talking about. I haven't got a clue. I'll paint. There must be a, a some skill and technique in what I'm doing, but I genuinely think half the time I just do it and it just seems to work. But um Same, yeah. <laughs> I'm just I feel like you just gotta be you, just be you when it comes to art and don't try and fit in with the crowd, no like. I don't belong in an art gallery sitting here with a glass of red wine talking shit. Um, that's just not me. So I think I am who I am, and I just, I'm always me. That's it. Um, I feel like I'm a nice person. Like, I get told I'm a nice person, so maybe I am. <laughs> I seem pretty sound, to be fair. Um, yeah, and I'm not, I'm, I'm honest, you know what I mean? Like, um, no bull But I don't know now, you've got me head battered here. What made me successful? Do you know, I'd probably say my wife and my daughter without getting all emotional. I was going to, I was wondering. Hey, I'm going gonna, gonna gonna to be sick. Up. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, I, I, if you mentioned them, because you, you mentioned your wife and it seems like she's had a, a massive role in, in yeah. where you're at. Great today. support network. I probably would have quit painting about once a month for the past five years of it went for it. Right. I'm going to read this out to you now, right? So. I had, I'd say, a little bit of a wobble the past couple of days. And um, my head just went, and it was art-related. And I just didn't feel like I knew where I was going to go. Now, I probably would still be in bed now, and I probably would have swerved this podcast tonight if it wasn't for her. So this morning, I'm lying in bed, and I was like, I said to her, listen, I said, just leave me to sleep. If I'm asleep, I don't have to worry, and I don't have to think about anything then. Anyway, half an hour later... The bedroom door opens and I had a cup of coffee at the side of the cabinet and a piece of paper got put in my hand. <clears throat> and I took a photograph of it so I could I weren't gonna lose the paper. But she just wrote this to me. Here is the here is the tough love. You like to dish it out. 
no one's coming to save you except me with my coffee. Get up, move, paint, anything. Love you. Bump. And that was it. Great. And I just thought, f*** off. And I just dived out of bed this morning. And I'm 80% through a new painting already today because of here. So I'd say a lot of my success comes down to support from my wife, my daughter, who's like the biggest cheerleader for me ever. Um, yeah. And I'm decent at what I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you are pretty good, mate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Incred um, some incredible paintings, mate. Are you continuously still trying to teach yourself new stuff and new techniques and trying new things? And, and do you find it difficult? Like, I, as an illustrator, I always find it, I'm always trying to better myself. And I always think that it's hard because I always think that what I've done is not good enough. I, I, I don't know if it's all of us who are in that same boat and then. You know, I look back at it and I think actually it's pretty good. And then I try to do something else, make myself better. And but then I don't know whether it's better. It's just different, if that makes sense. And I just wondered if you if if you you have the same sort of process. Obviously, your artwork is amazing, but do you always continuously try new techniques that you think will improve you. So I, what I've done is I feel like I've got to a point where most people see my way and they know that it's yeah. a job job. They'll know straight away. So I've got to be careful that I don't move too much away from that yeah but at the same time i don't want to remain like stagnant and not evolve yeah. anymore and um, what i would say that over the past year and i feel like this is i don't know if this sounds big headed but every time i finish a painting now i seem to feel like whoa that's boss that like i'm finishing it and i'm like i done that whereas a couple of years back every piece i've done i'd have to call somebody in or I'd send a picture to somebody I'd need somebody else to tell me that it's a good painting for yeah. me to feel like it was a good painting where I'm getting to, I feel like I'm getting to a stage now where if I look at it and I'm like, man, that, that, then it's gone. Uh, or I tend to know if they're good paintings. I try to bring in not like completely new mediums, but like different things. So the other week I bought the like little tubes like this of acrylic ink Oh, I have like acrylic ink where you can use it as a dropper, but this was weird. Um, but I've, I've included it on a few paintings recently. You can kind of write with it, but it'll drip and stuff. So yeah. I bring in little things like that, and every now and again, I might just try like a different technique where you know you'll get a bit of bubble wrap, you'll stick the bubble wrap to it, peel it off, and leave a new texture. Um, but if, if I just jump back to that little tube, I bought these uh, a blue one and a pink one. Now, I never read the back of anything, but over the past six months, me and my wife have been obsessed with looking at what's in your food and the GMOs and all, like, carcinogens in house products. So I looked on the back of this, uh, this paint, and in bold letters it says, in the state of California, this causes cancer. <laughs> Just there. It's like, what the f***? And I've never seen that on paint before. It's specifically said, I think it's um, the Golden brand I was like Jesus Christ really, so yeah. check out because I, <laughs> I used to be painting right and then I, if, I, if I couldn't be asked putting the paintbrush in the water I'd just suck the paint off yeah <laughs> I'd just carry yeah. on painting I won't now Christ, well, you, 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 you just effectively closed California as a marketplace for your, uh, for your work there. Yeah, if there's anyone in San Diego or California, San Francisco, anywhere like that, you don't want to buy any of John's work. They're really on the board, aren't they, for carcinogens and stuff and anything that causes yeah. cancer. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're heavily on it. But yeah, so I always try to include new little things. So you'll see, like, there might be some paint flicks, there might be. I've got, like I said, these old droppers, so I'll put the paint on the floor, floor and I'll do droplets of paint, paint so they splash everywhere. Um, quite a lot of the time, I try to, like, I'll use water and spray water and let that just do something with the painting itself. Yeah. And it just works. Like, one day it might just turn one to shit, but so far it's, it's worked. I think just not being scared of what I'm going to do yeah. is probably the most important part of it. And I was like, there's just no fear when it comes to it. Like, if I think I was going to put that paint there, I'll put it there. If it doesn't work, I'll let it dry and I'll paint back over it. And if I can't, yeah. then I start again. Yeah, definitely. I don't, I, we just, I'm, I'm always like that with the digital stuff because I know if I just do something that's 
experimental. I can just double tap with my fingers and it'll just get undo. Yeah, yeah. So I, if I'd spent like 10 hours, I don't know how long your painting's taking, because the big, I'm assuming, it take you a while. Yeah. And if I spent like 10 hours on something and then I experimented through, <laughs> through, like, through like pink on them, and I'd fucking <laughs> <laughs> wasted, I've just wasted 10 hours of my life. Do you know what? We, so fair play. I tried to explain this to people recently, so I'm doing this thing where I'm throwing some uh, fluorescent pink paint at the paintings. I've had to practice how to throw paint. Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. There's a million different ways. Yeah. So, like, I'm either stood on a stool and throwing it down, or I'm throwing it like as if you're swilling someone, or I'm overhand throwing it. So, even something like that. I've been that's like just something new that I've been trying and it's yeah. working quite cool. It's just a completely different effect. Uh, yeah. yeah, I always try new things. They might be on four paintings and then never ever appear on another painting again. But yeah. I will always try to evolve. And that's what that latest exhibition that I had in September last year was called Evolution. Oh really? That was two years worth of painting when we were all locked in. And some of them I probably would never have dreamt of putting out there. But it was different subjects. It was different different styles. And it was like an evolution of my work over two years. So I put that all out there for everybody to see. Kind of like, like it or you don't. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. try different things. I definitely... Like, some people message me now saying, you need to do more uh, landscapes. I'm like, F- that. Yeah. Like, but people really enjoyed me landscapes that I'd done a while back. But that's not something that I enjoy doing that much now. So I just don't do it. But again, that's just another, is it the same tool to your belt or whatever? Like yeah. That. I think yeah, it does, that does link into that that sort of continued success. I'm I'm exactly the same. I, my stuff changes monthly, uh, daily sometimes. It, and it's just different style after different style. And it's not to make more sales or to be look better to people. It's just because I get bored and I, I want to, I want to try new things, and and I yeah. suppose it, it always adds to me to me toolkit, like you said. Do you ever find that it's me asking the questions? Now, but <laughs> this is why I tend to not follow as many artists as other people do. Like that, be dead artists like Van Gogh and Rembrandt and Pollock and Rothko and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I watched the documentary on Rothko the other day, and the next thing I know, two of my paintings look like Rothko had done them. Yeah. But knock off versions. Do you yeah. ever find that if you see other people's work, like not intentionally, but you kind of bring their work into yours a little bit? Yeah, all the time. All the time, yeah. I look at Man. I look at different illustrators and I if I like something, I'll almost try and recreate it, but add my own style to it. Um just to see it and, and I think a lot of it is a is um just to see whether I can. Like just to see the techniques they used, and you know, it, it depends on obviously how complex it is. If something looks like it's taken you know, twenty four hours, I'm like, maybe Don't not. Don't be copying none of my. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't copy that, mate. Um, <laughs> but I think I, I, I think a lot of the time I suffer from imposter syndrome. I think that you know I'm not as good as I am, but I know that I am good. If you know what I mean, and I kind of think like I've managed to forge a career as an illustrator, but like it's all been luck and. That, that in my head I need to get out of that I've actually worked hard um so but I, yeah I continuously look at other people's art and I think that's also just uh, just to help me progress I feel like I can't stay still I can't I can't do the same thing over and over and over again because I because it becomes that you do it so well and you do it so quick it almost gets to a point where I feel like it gets a little bit boring if that makes sense so I want to try something different try something new and the only way to do that is to study other people's artwork and see what they do and kind of look at the techniques so yeah i do that all the time to be honest with you yeah i'm i'm the same i i don't shy away from it but um i try and just take like elements from people's stuff so i might look at it and go oh i think the way they've done the line works really interesting you know the way that they've rendered this part of the shadow or an effect that they've put on like the hair so like i try and take small things that you can then like synthesize into your own approach without it feeling as though you're borrowing too heavily but it is really interesting isn't it because you think of the centuries of art where nobody will have ever seen each other's work ever 
Like we live in the we live in the first part of time where we can reference everything that's ever existed. Like you know, because I'm a filmmaker as well as doing the illustration stuff. And I always say to people, I was like, people making films in like the seventies. They couldn't watch films that came out in the 50s. They didn't have VHS. The films weren't really on telly. Like, they just made what felt right. We're the, for the first time, we feel the need to, like, study everything. And it, I, I think you need, to, you need to be able to free yourself from that at the same time. Yeah. I, 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 from my perspective, I, I look at everything. Like, I, like John, I've done that, um, I done that John Barnes illustration about 18 months ago when it was it this it was my luckily something that what you've just said then i found a style that people can recognize that it's mine so i can put in an element of something that you do in yours into mine and people will know it's mine and not think it's a copy so like i'd, I'd done like like gold strokes on a john barnes that was that was based off yours and it turned out really well um i edited it like 13 times so it didn't ruin it but um I a lot of mine, I, I don't tend to dwell on other artists that much. I, I get a lot of my uh, inspiration from from cultural stuff, so music videos, film, TV. That, that's where most of my colors, color work, and uh, and concepts come from. I've just I'm releasing a video, um, I might do it tomorrow or not a bit late. Um, from the LeBron James I've done recently. That was from like based on the Fresh Prince LA nineties two pack, like all of that was all built into that 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 illustration. So, yeah, that's that's sort of where mine comes from. I think I think the other thing like that we all get hung up on a lot of the time, you know, especially with the social media stuff we were saying before, is like we're all still probably really early in our careers. And so, like, you know, I think if you look at a lot of artists, you know, you think of somebody like Picasso, for example, um, his style of, like, um, cubism and and that kind of stuff earlier in his career was nothing like the really abstract stuff he was doing much later on in his career. And I'm sure that if you go back through loads of artists, like, you know, you mentioned Rothko. I know that there was a bunch of um, artists that came out that were, like, you know, essentially Rothko copies, but then went on to be some of the greatest artists of the 20th century, but they just started off by doing that. And I think that's the other thing is like, you know, to illustrators out there who are trying to start their career, we all need to stop trying to rush to the end of our career. Like, you know, you might, you might not be the artist you're going to be for another 10 years and that's fine. Yeah. Like what I said earlier, when I was doing my Disney paintings, I painted Disney for about five years. Yeah. It earned me a living. It got me slightly recognised. It got people talking. And then when me, my way came into it, then obviously things blew up. So, yeah, yeah. I think. But me, my concern is sometimes I can't look at somebody's way and without knowing, I'm looking at me painting the next day and like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> Rip yeah, them yeah. off. It's there. <laughs> you could, yeah. I, I, I do look at it sometimes, but... I, Every time I'm approaching a new piece, I always say to myself, where's the concept for this coming from? I always sit down and do it. Like I'll say, I've got like gold and blue in my head. Where's this gold and blue coming from? Yeah. I, watched, I watched Kanye West video last night and it was full of it. You know what I mean? Like I'll, yeah. I'll make sure I sort of zone in on where it's come from. But just copy people in it. <laughs> <laughs> just copy who you want. If that's yeah. what gets someone started with art, Play. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. and most of us probably won't. Our art won't be artwork won't be famous until we're dead anyway. So you know that's how yeah. it works. Oh, that's, what I'm <laughs> that's one of my things that way. Time making sure I enjoy my artwork while I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I, 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 I'm going to be honest. I reckon from John's experience with social media, as soon as this drops, we're getting booted from every platform anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> completely shadow banned. <laughs> absolutely, mate. Absolutely. Um, so. One one question I did want to ask that I think um, I guess maybe just to try and wrap up on you as an artist. Uh, I don't think you necessarily spe specifically touched on this obviously you've got a very distinct style you kind of spoke to us about how you got there but was there a moment where you finished a piece and all of a sudden you were like that's it that's me this is my style moving forward yeah um i done a palette knife painting of the hulk and iron man <laughs> they were my first palette knife paintings and it was at that point i was like 
Oof, I just loved it because it. I'm not a fine artist. Like, I don't like. I couldn't do like the Rembrandt style. Or, yeah. Like, I don't know if I've got that talent in me, but I haven't got the patience in me. Definitely, I like to do be quite explosive. So when I done them, I remember sitting back thinking, "That's it." Now, the, that's I want to be a palette knife painter. But then the line work came into it, and I don't know where it, people keep asking me because I'm putting golden lines on my pieces. They're like, is it related to the cocaine abuse and you were snorting white lines? And I'm like, yeah, 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 that's it. That's what it is. Yeah, that's it. But <laughs> yeah, I've got art books down here, and there is one, there's an art book in there, and it was like a technical drawer. And when they would do technical drawings or even architecture, you quite often see the pencil flicks off the image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing yeah. and I seen that, and I was like, Oh, and I put it on one of my paintings after I'd finished it. And the lines that I put on just made the painting a million times better. So I used to mess about like using different colored lines, but then I'd done one in of Conor McGregor with gold lines, and it just looked like he was expensive. Yeah. And um, ever since then, it tends to be always gold lines for me. Policy. I've got one last kind of slightly more random question just to to cap it all off if that's okay with you guys. Go for, yeah, it. Go for it, mate. So I get the impression from a couple of your Instagram posts that I've seen and one piece I know I've seen of yours that is the bread Jordan ones that you might have an, a bit of an affinity for sneakers, is that right? <laughs> yeah, good. Uh so <laughs> what's your favorite pair and then without telling us how much it cost, what's your most expensive pair? Okay, my favourite pair is my most expensive pair. Great. Um, should I just take you back here, right? So, two years ago, I used to have one pair of trainees a year. Yeah. That would be it. I, I never could afford more than that. So I had. A, I remember when I was in Dubai and I had me notice it. I had a white pair of Puma. They were f-ing gorgeous, but I had that was the only pair that I was have for the year. Now. I must be touching on about 20, 25 pairs of Jordans at the minute. Nice. Wow. Um, Just I, Jordans. I, I, can, I can relate to that situation. Yeah. I've got <laughs> I've got about 10 pairs of Air Force Ones, but I don't even wear them. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. Air Force One started, and then I was like, ooh, can I get away with wearing Jordans? And then they've just become, uh, every week, I, I'm on a ban at the minute, my missus is like, no more. <laughs> Um, so what was your question? Did you want me to explain what the pair, my favourite pair is? Just, yeah, just tell us your favourite pair and the, and as we know, it's also the most expensive pair. So it's the, um, it's the patent leather. It's the, I think it's the band ones, the black and red Jordans. Yeah, 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 yeah. The high tops and the patent leather. So I got them, but I had to get them off a reseller. Yeah. They're, yeah. Now, they're now worth about 450 Nice. Wow. So yeah, just buy, buying sneakers when they actually drop, especially any uh, retro Jordan 1 release is a nightmare. Absolute nightmare. Yeah. Oh, hard. I mean, I bought a pair, um, an orange and white pair. Like, the orange was like a metallic colour. And I got them for 110. Got them on the Nike store. I was I was like, yes. A week later, they sold out, and the, the price had shot up to, like, 250 or something. I was like, ooh. And then Nike brought them back out again. Yeah. But to be honest... I've never ever bought a pair of trainees thinking I'm going to sell them on. No, um, I, never. I, it does my head in when people buy them not to wear them, to be honest with you. I'm like, yeah, see, yeah. I like to do, where's the camera? I like to get my nails done to match my trainees as well. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Pretty cool. Nice wear. I used to have a problem with trainers as well um, until I had kids. It's not a problem. No, until I had kids, it had to stop. It's not a, it's not a problem. It was a problem. I had, <laughs> the kids are, I the, kids are the problem. Pairs. <laughs> the trainers are fine the kids are the problem <laughs> i had about 50 pairs of trainers at, at one point i think it was um, and then it all stems back to being at school actually being honest with you because i was always that kid who had the <laughs> pair of trainers while everyone else had the night pair and i was wearing you know the high tech or you know some some name brand from yeah like and and in my head gola i always thought when i got yeah gola was another one and i always thought yeah. that when i got to a point that i could afford to buy trainers myself I would always buy them, and then I just continuously bought trainer after trainer. I used to have like the Jordans, Harachis. I had like everything to a point. Whatever was in, you know, there was a there was a point where um, Nike TNs were just the range. Everybody had the Nike TNs, and 
and all these things. And then I just got to a point where I started to have kids and I was like, mm, food or... <laughs> Buy me kids, and, the um, boss trainees. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, he, his trainers actually are right, but I've thankfully managed to, to calm down. But I know what a trainer addiction is like, 100%. <laughs> For me, it's just the... Um, it, it goes back to what you said. As a kid, I never had loads of trainers or nothing like that. Even when I got to an adult, I would never be able to afford loads of trainees. I got to a point where if I sold a painting, I'd buy a pair of trainees. Sold a painting, I'd buy a pair of trainees. And that's the way I kept doing it. But now I'm like, I've, I've got enough for now. Yeah. yeah. Can't wear them all at once, can you? Keep an eye on, keep an eye on Instagram, you'll have another pair next week. Yeah. <laughs> As my accountant will tell you, I need nice shoes to wear to meetings. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Good point. Um, so just wrapping up then, John, and I'll before we sort of um, just see where people can find you and stuff online. Yoni, I don't think you were here or we were recording at the time, but John was telling us about two prints that he's got to potentially do a giveaway with us. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, John, I don't know whether you want to just give the details of those. Right, so... We have, I have uh, original paintings and then we have our limited edition prints, which we do 50 of. And then we have another size print, uh, which we call our international edition, but we only do 25 of these. So this is, what happened was that the fellow who uses our prints, he printed two of these by mistake. So we're going to offer one of these to use, which is our Jordan Anderson Champions print. Beautiful. Oh no, I wonder if I'll win. <laughs> I was just thinking exactly the same thing. Well, look at that space there, John. It's, it's, it's a nice space in my new house. So, I'm normally, I'm to if, it, if it was somebody, if it was somebody local, and we could deliver it to them, hand deliver, we'd get it mounted. But a lot of the time now, it's outside of Liverpool, so they get shipped like that in a tube, and it'll have a certificate of authenticity with it as well for whatever number that it is. Brilliant. Um, so yeah, we're gonna. Donate that... one of them to your podcast for you to. It's awesome. Man. Give Thank away. you very much, mate. Really appreciate that. And I'm, am I right in saying uh, that print isn't actually available anymore? No. So the, the the smaller sized ones completely sold out in 24 hours. We've only just started bringing out the international edition size. So I think we've we've probably got about 15 of them left at the minute. They might be on the website. I think at the moment under the got... international. Tab. Uh, okay, cool. Because um, I'm literally I'm going to buy one as soon as we finish recording. <laughs> See, there you go. That's what you get. You get stuff away. But yeah, looking forward to doing that giveaway, and I'm sure I'm sure one of our followers will be made up to to uh, to win that because the artwork's incredible and it looks even better in person as well. Um, Can I ask one favour before we go? Of course, mate. Yeah. yeah, go for it. Right. So this is a little plug for my daughter. Right, she's only eleven, and she starts their own little business. Making bracelets, crystal Obviously. bracelets, and these ones, right? The kid is absolutely flying. Definitely. She's reached out to loads of people on Instagram, like influencers and stuff, and they're all like, yeah, go on. And they're all waiting the for her now. So her account is emmy.elizabeth on Instagram. If you're not going to follow me, follow her. I'd love you to follow her before me. Well, we'll pop that in the description as well for anybody yeah, um, willing to go and follow. Um, yeah. And we'll make sure that that's part of having a chance to win that print is you have to go and follow her as well. Yeah, yes. yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. Is there, any, is there any other places people can find you or do you want to link the Owen McVeigh Foundation, John? We'll stick it all in the description anyway. But... Yeah. If you can link the Owen McVeigh Foundation, that'd be fantastic. Um, most of my socials are just Artist John Charles and my website is www.artistjohncharles.com Brilliant. Brilliant, mate. Sad. Well, thanks very much for coming on, mate brilliant podcast so as yeah as Callie was saying um thanks so much for coming on john it's been really interesting to hear about your journey to learn more about um your process and your artwork i'm sure that everybody um here will agree um and yeah can't wait to talk to you again it's been an absolute pleasure to finally get on yeah yes. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 yeah thanks for coming on man. it was absolutely worth the wait mate thank you thank you so much thanks for having me on all right john cheers mate right. speak well, soon lads. Take care, later, later, man. Man. Take care, man. See you later. Thanks again for watching. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Don't forget to like and subscribe.